this morning. Uh, good news, we're not talking about head coverings. So someone asked me this week uh, if my study time was cut down, and I said yes, drastically, uh, because this morning we're going to be addressing uh, the Lord's Supper. So if you'll turn to verse 17 of chapter 11, we're going to read verse 17 all the way through 34. As Paul addresses this selfishness that is being displayed at the Lord's Supper. And he gives us at least one purpose of the Lord's Supper, which is to remedy or to be an antidote against our own selfishness. Let's read the text. But in the following instructions, I do not commend you, because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and I believe it in part, for there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill. Some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together, eat. To eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home. So that when you do come together, it will not be for judgment. About other, the other things, I will give directions when I come. Let's pray. Father, we come now to your word, your holy an errant, infallible word. And we ask that you would bless the preaching of your word. We ask that you would give us ears to hear and hearts to receive. Uh, you would expose selfishness in our life, but you would direct us to the attention uh, of, of our Savior. You would point us to the grace you offer us in Jesus. I would get out of the way. Y you, would, you would be glorified, Lord, and you would equip and edify, save and sanctify your people. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, as we address the topic of the Lord's Supper, I think it's only appropriate just to ask the simple question, what is the purpose of the Lord's Supper? After all, if you call this your home, you would have noted that we participate in the Lord's Supper weekly. So, so what is the purpose of this meal? I, I would argue that there are many Christians in this country, and maybe some of you in this room, that, that may not be able to answer that. In fact, I can recall uh, a season in my life where I was a believer, but you know, I, I participated in the Lord's Supper on a regular basis, but I don't know if I was able to articulate an answer had you asked me, well, what is the purpose of this? If you're honest, you, you approach the table with sincerity, right? You do your best when, when the time comes to, to, to keep your mind from racing, right, about what's happening later today or this week, to, to try to settle your mind on Jesus and not think about lunch because your stomach's growling, right, to, to think about what he's done for you on the cross. But if you're honest, maybe you don't know what's happening when the, when the pastor gets up and declares the words and says, do this in remembrance of me, and then you eat the bread and here we drink a, a cup of juice. Maybe even you ask yourself, what, what is the purpose of this? Well, as we get to our text this morning, I think that the Apostle Paul is going to give us at least one purpose. Now, I would argue there are many purposes of what we would call the Lord's Supper or communion. But Paul is going to give us at least one. Remember, the Apostle Paul last week addressed this issue of corporate worship. 
He began chapter 11 by turning his attention to corporate worship, which he's going to address corporate worship for the next several chapters. And he addressed this issue of, of proper attire in the worship gathering, the distinction between men and women, the, the headship of male that God has given to, to the family and also to the church, and why that's good and why that should be expressed and, and displayed in the worship gathering. And now he, he addresses another issue in corporate worship, the, the issue of taking the Lord's Supper, but he addresses the abuse of this that is happening in the church of Corinth. Paul's purpose here is not to give us a discourse on the Lord's Supper. Now, maybe you're new to the Bible, but there's not many places in Scripture that teach about the Lord's Supper. I mean, we have it in the Gospels where Jesus institutes it, and only in 1 Corinthians do we get any instruction at all on the Lord's Supper. We have in Revelation the marriage feast of the Lamb that we'll talk about in a bit, but, but that's all we've gotten. Right? So Paul doesn't really give us a lot of explanation on why we're doing what we're doing, but I think if we think about the context, he does give us a purpose. And, and that serves as our main point this morning if you're taking notes. The Lord's Supper is an antidote for the selfishness in our life. That's one of its purposes, and we're going to see that clearly today. The Lord's Supper is an antidote for the selfishness in our lives. It's a remedy. It's something that God uses to combat selfishness. And, and see, here is the irony. We're going to read, and we just read, we're going to see in the text that the Corinthians actually use the Lord's Supper to display selfishness, not for the supper to combat their selfishness. So Paul needs to correct that. Okay? And now let's, let's put ourselves in the shoes of the Corinthians. We're, we're, we don't take the Lord's Supper the exact same way they did, but we take it weekly. So this is very applicable to us because Paul's combating selfishness. And if we're honest, we all deal with selfishness. I, I told the last service that more than likely many of you exhibited some form of selfishness today. Maybe it was before church. You men were, were wanting to get out the door on time. And you know, our wives love to take their sweet times getting ready. And you kind of rushed your wife because you thought you were going to be late. Or, or maybe it was in the car when there was a dispute over what you were going to eat for lunch when you got home. I don't know, but I was, I'm willing to bet that, that there was some selfishness that has been exhibited in all of us this morning. So this is a very applicable text. So I want to see this morning that the Lord's Supper is an antidote. And we're going to see it through three characteristics of the Lord's Supper and three corresponding questions as we seek to apply this to ourselves. Because we're a church that takes the Lord's Supper weekly. So we want to take it in a worthy manner as Paul exhorts the Corinthians to do. So the first characteristic we're going to see uh, regarding the Lord's Supper and how it forces us to confront our selfishness is simply this, if you'll put the slide on the screen. The Lord's Supper displays the oneness of the church. The question we need to ask is, then I, am I living in unity with the church? Am I living in unity with Christ's body? Look at verse 17. Verse 17, Paul says, In the following instructions, I do not commend you. Because when you come together, it's not for the better but for the worse. If you were here last week, you know the Apostle Paul did commend the church in verse 2. He commended them for keeping the traditions and teachings that he had passed down to them. Clearly, they didn't keep every teaching and tradition, but regarding head coverings, this idea of male headship, they had for the most part kept it. Paul commends them, but he cannot commend them when it comes to the Lord's Supper. Paul says, no, 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 when you get together to celebrate this, it's actually best that you just don't come together at all because it's for the worse. Verse 18, Paul says, in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear there are divisions among you. When you assemble together to worship and hear the preaching of the word and, and take the Lord's Supper, there are divisions among you. This should uh, jog our memory back to the beginning of 1 Corinthians if you've been here, which by the way, if you're new, we've been preaching through 1 Corinthians for, gosh, about 23, 24 weeks, give or take a week. I'm not exactly sure. We've been preaching through it for quite a while. Paul's already addressed division in the church. In chapter 1, verses 10 through 12, Paul, Paul reminds the church or tells the church this, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree that there be no divisions among you, that you're united in the same mind and the same judgment. He says, it's been reported to me by Chloe's people that there's quarreling among you. 
What I mean is that each, of, each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. In fact, for four chapters, Paul dealt with this issue of division. And this church was divided over the teachers that they follow, right? Some said, I follow Paul. After all, it's Paul that planted this church. Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. You can hear the arguments. I follow Paul. He's the guy that baptized me. I was converted under his preaching. I know Paul. I've gone to lunch with Paul. Paul's my boy. And then you've got those that said, Paul, are you kidding? Paul didn't even follow Jesus while he was on this earth. Paul was the least and last of the apostles. I follow Peter. Peter's one of the 12. He is one of Jesus's inner circle. I follow Peter. And then you've got some that said, well, have you heard this guy Apollos preach? I mean, have you heard? Man, this guy can throw down when he preaches. He's eloquent and articulate. I follow Apollos. I don't follow Paul or Peter. And then you've got those that said, I don't even need a human leader. I just follow Jesus, the very self-righteous Christ followers. You see, here we see that the division goes deeper than just the teachers and the theology uh, of the church. The, the division is, is far more than that. It's regarding the socioeconomic background of the people in the church. This is a division over status now, and it's being displayed at the Lord's Supper. We know that because of what Paul's about to say. Look at what Paul says next in verse 19. He gives an aside, a very puzzling statement. Paul makes, he says, look, for there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. I had to do a double take when I was studying this passage. What do you, what, why is this verse here? What are you talking about? Because it would make much more sense if Paul just went from verse 18 all the way to verse 20 and just continued on well, the divisions. But Paul's, Paul, Paul almost gives like a parenthesis. Like, let, let, me, let me clarify something for you. Now commentators debate over what Paul might mean. Either he's being sarcastic, and the Apostle Paul often does that. He uses sarcasm when he gives rebukes. See, you upper status folks, you, you really want to be approved? You really want to be noted? Let's look at what these divisions are giving you. That, that could be the tone of his words. Or maybe, and this is where I lean, maybe he is saying that God sovereignly uses human sin to bring about his will. I think that's what the Apostle Paul is saying. Even in our stubbornness and rebellion, God doesn't waste it. He doesn't waste sin. This doesn't give anyone freedom to sin. Paul's obviously not saying, it's a good thing you guys are divided. But Paul's saying, look, God is going to use this sin to bring about his, his glory and, and the good of the church because those people who are truly Christians are going to stick around through the division. I have known many people from my past who at one time claimed to be Christians, maybe you did too, but now they're not. And what happened was there was a disagreement they had with the church and it wasn't a doctrinal disagreement. It wasn't a, a, a disagreement by which we should probably leave a church, right? There are some matters by which division is actually good. When we have our membership meetings, we explain that. What, what should we cling tight to? What should we divide over, right? And, and we lay out just kind of this idea of a triage, which is a good way to think when you think of first tier, second tier, and third tier. Those first two tiers are really important to our understanding of the gospel and how we live out our life as Christians in the local church. And we say, hey, those are kind of closed-handed issues. We don't ever want to divide over. But the divisions I'm talking about are people that disagreed on lower tier issues. Maybe their feelings were hurt. Maybe the, the pastor didn't meet with them over coffee when they wanted to. Something minor, something petty, something that was said that where, where they didn't walk through the biblical process of reconciliation and they were hurt. In their minds, uh, they were burnt. And, and we hear this term a lot nowadays, this idea of church hurt, which I think has been majorly abused, be careful. Well, what I think is they were just bitter. And they left the church. You guys are thinking of people in your mind. You know that this has happened to. And we look back now, five, ten years later, and they were, they're not even following Jesus at all. They're not in a church. They're not, not in a church at all. Remember the parable of the soils, Mark 4? We talked about that a few weeks ago. And Jesus said there's going to be a few that it's going to look like they're bearing fruit, right? But give it some time. Give it some time. That will be squeezed out. That seed will be squeezed out by the pleasures of the world, by temptations and trials. And that's what I think Paul is alluding to here. There's going to be people that don't stick through the divisions, right? Because God will, God will use the divisions to weed out people that weren't truly uh, regenerated by the powerful work of the Spirit, that didn't truly have a heart of good soil. And that's what I think Paul's saying. Hey, these divisions are going to serve a purpose. 
Now let's get back to the text. That's my, that's my thoughts on that text. It's either sarcasm or sovereignty, but God says this in verse 20. I'm sorry, Paul says this. When you do come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. Put yourself in the shoes of the Corinthians reading this letter. What do you mean, Paul? It's not the Lord's Supper that we eat. Of course it is. I'm sure there were many thinking to themselves, Paul, we eat the bread, drink the, the wine, the cup. There's a pastor that preaches and he tells us what this means. He talks about Jesus. The gospel is proclaimed. What do you mean we don't take the Lord's Supper? Look at what he says next. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? They're turning the Lord's Supper into a selfish, self-gratifying party. And they're excluding certain members of the church, segregating themselves. And Paul says, you want to treat the Lord's Supper as a party? That's what your house is for. He says, do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say? Shall I commend you? No, I'm not going to commend you for this. Paul's not concerned with merely the actions of taking in the Lord's Supper. He's concerned with the attitude, the manners by which the Lord's Supper is taken. And he says, just because you take in the bread and you drink the wine doesn't mean you're actually taking the Lord's Supper. Maybe you've heard it called communion. We'll talk in a moment about why it's called communion as well. And that's an appropriate name. Now, to understand what Paul is saying, we need to understand the cultural context of the early church. Paul says, don't be fooled. You're not really taking the Lord's Supper when you gather together. The context of the early church is a little bit different than our context. The method of corporate worship does, did not look like this in Corinth. A few reasons why. Well, most of you have today off. It's Sunday. We have the weekends off in 20. First century America, most of us, some of us do have to work, but we do get days off. Well, in the Roman world, the first day of the week fell on a work day. So the, 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 the day of the Lord, which is our Sunday, was celebrated, but when they worshiped together, it had to be after working hours. So more, li more than likely, most churches celebrated uh, their worship gatherings and, and celebrated Jesus in the afternoon hours after work hours. Not only that, but most churches had to meet in homes. They didn't have access to public buildings like we do. Remember, Christianity was a heavily persecuted uh, religion and belief system in the ancient world. They didn't have access to these large... Now, not every church. We, we know in Acts that they, they did have access, but, but most churches met in homes. And if you had a home large enough to have a church there, more than likely you were wealthy. So there were probably wealthy members of the church in Corinth who were opening up their homes for the worship gathering. And it would, it would look like this. They would come together in the afternoons and they would eat their dinner meal. Everyone would bring something, right? We do this a lot here when we have our member meetings. We have a potluck. They had potlucks. Everybody would contribute to the meal. And they would feast. They would celebrate. And then, uh, uh, I'm sorry, prior to that, should I say, it would begin with a worship gathering. They would preach. They would have their, their service, their worship service. There would be uh, the word proclaimed and taught just as happening is happening now. Then after that, I'm sorry, would be their feast, their time of fellowship. It was called the agape meal. And it would happen in a home. And then after that would have been the Lord's Supper. They would have stuck around and they would have celebrated the Lord's Supper. We have to remember, typical homes back then weren't 2,200 square feet with four bedrooms and a couple of bathrooms. They were small, right? Think smaller apartments. Typical homes back then, a larger home would have held about nine to ten people. The rooms weren't very big, and there was a dining room, a triclinium, where those nine to ten people would squeeze into. Now, they would have an atrium, which is similar to a patio, which would have been outside, that would have held more people, maybe 30 people. This was kind of the atmosphere for the early church. Now remember, if you owned a home, more than likely you had money. And if you had money, that meant you were friends with people that also had money. So those that had access to the dining area, which was called the triclinium, were probably higher status friends, and they got preferential seating. You had those in the atrium on the outside, the, the, the blue-collar workers, maybe even the slaves, 
So here you see a natural segregation in the church. And what's happening here is during that fellowship meal, uh, you have the richer folks bringing in their food, bringing in their steak and their shrimp and their meat. Because remember, we, when we talked about food sacrifice to idols, it was only available to those that were uh, in the higher uh, statuses of society because only they could afford it. And they would bring their wine because they were getting drunk off the wine. They were partying it up. And, and out in the atrium, you had the common folk, right, who maybe could bring bread. Maybe they brought a, a gallon of tea. I don't know. They could only bring what they could bring, right? And here you see that the, the rich are eating it up, right, taking their food and eating, not sharing with any out here. They're getting drunk right in front of their eyes while they're going hungry. And Paul says, what are, are you guys crazy? This isn't how it's supposed to be. I've never flown in first class, but I've seen first class. I know first class has bigger seats. I know they have more luxurious seats. I know there's more space. I know they get better food. They probably have a different menu than we do back in uh, business class or economy class, which is usually where I sit when I fly on a plane. And I know this. When I get on the plane and everybody's on the plane and we start, start to take off, the curtain shut. I'm not allowed up there in first class anymore, right? That's how an airline operates, but that's not how the church should operate. And it's clear in this text, that's how this church was operating. The church is not an airline. The church is a diverse community of believers. And this is why Jesus said, I mean, this is why Paul said, you're not taking the Lord's Supper at all. Remember in chapter 10, verse 17, Paul says, the Lord's Supper is where we celebrate and, and portray our oneness. He said in verse 17, there is one bread. We who are many are one body for we all partake of the one bread. Paul's reminding the church that when you gather together and you celebrate the Lord's Supper, there is a unity that is to be portrayed. They're not portraying the unity. Now I know when we take the Lord's Supper and we're going to do that in a little bit, we have conveniently broken up the bread for you. But you do know that all of those little pieces came from one loaf. We don't have some wheat bread and some sourdough bread and some rye bread all mixed in. No, no, no. They all came from one loaf. This is to show the, the oneness that we now have because of Jesus. You see, the Corinthians haven't gotten this. Jesus loves diversity, church, but Jesus hates division. He hates division. And if we think about our church, we should be a very diverse church, a church that's diverse in race and ages and in stages of life and socioeconomic background, even maybe political views and our understanding of, of how we might parent or, or where we send our kids to school, homeschool, public school. But we shouldn't be a divided church. And the problem of division is when we take those petty differences and we elevate them to first tier importance. Clearly, that's what's happening here. So there is a question that we should ask ourselves, and that is simply this. Am I living in unity with Christ's body? Am I? The question is, are your actions portraying a life of unity with the church, or are you selfishly and maybe ignorantly living incongruent with that? Because listen, Paul's not merely concerned with, you know, the, the few moments after service that we celebrate the Lord's Supper. Our cultural context is different. You're, you're not going to be able to segregate yourself when we take that in a moment, right? You're going to come down, get your elements. You're going to go back to your seat. But how do you live Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday? How? Maybe you call yourself a part of this body, but there are no, there's not much evidence of that. Instead of giving your gifts and serving, you've hoarded those. Instead of giving your, your time, talent, and treasure, you've hoarded that. You're, you're living much like the Corinthians. Maybe you call yourself a church, but you say, look, I don't know if I can attend that group or I don't know if I can go to that Bible study. I don't know because they don't think like me. They're a little different than me. I don't get much out of it. They're, they're a little too immature. I mean, do you know the things they talk about? That's not, listen, I told the first service this and I'll tell you this. When you come to gather as a church, when you, when you go to group, did you know that primarily it's not about you? I think we all need to remember this. When you come to church on a Sunday, guess what? It's not about you. And I, I'm not making an apologies for telling you that. When you come, don't come and say, this better, I better get something out of this. They better tickle my ears when they play the guitar. The preacher better say exactly what I want them to. Because if he don't, I'm going to have some critiques when I go home. It's not about you. 
You don't get to pick. It's not about you. It's about God, first and foremost. And secondly, it's about others. It is about others. You know where you are? You're third on the list. You're not first and you're not second. You're third. And when you do rightly give it to Jesus and look to benefit others, guess what? God does build you up. You do get something out of it. But our problem is when we come to a group or we come to church and say, you know what? I better get something out of this. And that's our primary aim. We've got it backwards. You ask yourself that. That's how you know if you're living in unity with the body. Listen, church, the Lord's Supper demands that we take uh, this serious, that we take unity with the body serious. It demands that we put selfishness to death because selfishness is the enemy of unity. Now we'll see the second characteristic of the Lord's Supper in the next few verses. It declares the sacrifice of our Savior. It declares the sacrifice of our Savior. Paul says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. It's, it's interesting that Paul goes from rebuke to now the words of Jesus in the institution of the Lord's Supper. And he begins with the, the word for. I've shown you throughout this study that Paul does that a lot. right? He, he wants to link up the two. Why would Paul go from a rebuke, a stern rebuke, to now listen to what Jesus said regarding the Lord's Supper? Because Paul wants to contrast their selfish behavior with the selfless sacrifice of Jesus. He said, on the night he was betrayed. And these are the words of Jesus. He took bread. He gave thanks. He broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The words betrayed are Better probably translated delivered up. That's paradidomy in the Greek. It means delivered up. I think Paul, yes, has in mind Judas. Of course, if you know the story, you know Judas is the disciple that betrayed Jesus. But I think Paul also sees, once again, the sovereignty of God behind the sinfulness of man, that it wasn't ultimately Judas that delivered Jesus up. This was God's plan before eternity passed, right? Before eternity passed, God had a plan. The Father had a plan to send his Son to be delivered up. It was God that delivered him up. Paul wants them to see God didn't hoard his best gift. God gave his best gift for us. God in his mercy could have. He could have held Jesus back. He didn't have to give up his only son. He did though. The one that we offended, he gave himself in our place so that our bodies would not be broken. Our bodies would not be beaten. We wouldn't have to absorb God's wrath, but Jesus would in our stead. You see, Paul's recalling the selfless nature of Jesus' sacrifice. And then Paul goes to the words of Jesus that night. He broke the body, symbolizing what would happen on the cross. And then he said, this is my body. And the church has debated for centuries over what those words mean. If you were a, a Roman Catholic before you were uh, converted to Protestantism and saved, which I know several of you were, you might remember growing up being told, you know, when you take the bread and you take the juice, that's really Jesus' body and really Jesus' blood. He's physically present in those. That's called transubstantiation. We reject that. That's not what Jesus meant. Why? Because his physical body isn't there. Where is his physical body? It's in heaven at the right hand of the Father, and that's a good thing, right? Because if it weren't there, we would have no intercessor pleading uh, his righteousness on our behalf. We wouldn't have nobody taking the gaze of the Father off of our sins and onto his perfection. But Jesus does that for his church every single day because he is physically present in a human body right now beside the Father. But Jesus is God. So he can be with us. But how? Well, Martin Luther, the good Protestant that Martin Luther was, was still a bit confused. He said the Lord's Supper, yes, Jesus is with us, but it's, he's, he, he couldn't quite explain it. He's in and with and under the elements. Kind of like when you take a sponge and you dip it in water, the water's in the sponge. That's called consubstantiation. We would reject that. There was a, another reformer that came along named Ulrich Z Zwingli, he said, well, look, look at what Jesus said. He said, do this in remembrance of me. So in the meal, it's simply a meal to remember Jesus. And we would say, yes, that's, that's, that's good. It is a meal to remember Jesus. Those are signs, the bread and the wine, to remember what Jesus has done, but they're not empty signs. They really do portray something. Remember chapter 10, verse uh, 16. 
Paul said this, the cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? And the bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Fellowship, participation, koinonia. We believe that, yes, it's a memorial meal where we look back upon what Jesus has done, but Jesus is with us. Not physically, but we believe by faith that spiritually he is. And then when we take the bread and we drink the, the cup, he nourishes us and, and strengthens us. And we are actually fellowshipping with Jesus. This is what's happening. And then Paul, Paul tells us that night he broke the bread. We certainly do remember Jesus' broken body. We remember the words of Jesus. Do this in remembrance of me. As we're nourishing ourselves through the elements, as we're fellowshipping spiritually with Jesus, we certainly do remember what Jesus did. We remember that it wasn't our body that was beaten on the cross. It wasn't our flesh that was ripped off of our back. It wasn't our blood that poured out from the nails driven into our hands. It was Jesus that did that for us. Amen? Church, this was for you. Those are the words of the text. Jesus said which is for you. This is a personal, uh, a personal um, comment made by Jesus to all of us. Jesus, knowing the sins of our life, knowing your guilt, sins of your past that you never want to mention ever again. You don't want anyone to know about. He knows about them and he willingly said, you know, I am innocent, but I'll step into your place, the, the guilty one, and I'll trade places with you. I'll take that condemnation upon myself. Then Paul now alludes to the cup in verse 25. He said, in the same way he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. You may recall what Jesus was doing that night. He was eating the Passover meal that night with his disciples. This was the meal of remembrance under the old covenant. Pastor Tyler read it for us as we uh, walked through the, the time of confession this morning. We studied Exodus last year. You should have a good understanding of what that feast meant if you were with us. Maybe you don't. Let me jog your memory. That was to be eaten once a year. Once a year, year after year after year after year. For thousands of years, the people of God ate the Passover feast, right? To remind them of their freedom from slavery. The unleavened bread stood for the hastiness by which they were led out of Egypt. Remember, they didn't even have time to let their bread rise. The bitter herbs stood for the bondage that they suffered while they were in Egypt. And, and the Passover lamb stood for the blood that was shed right that night when they painted the blood of the lamb over their doorpost and the, the destroyer, the, the angel of death, passed over their house because the, uh, the lamb had died instead of them. Jesus said, that's me. Under the old covenant, you had this meal of remembrance, this Passover meal. Under the new covenant, you have this cup that's represented by my blood. In the old covenant, God gave his law through Moses, but praise God, we have a new covenant. Under that, he's given us his son to pay for our failure, to keep the law, to give up his blood instead of our blood. And notice Jesus didn't say wine. Jesus said, look at what Paul says, in the same way he took the cup. Over and over in Scripture, a cup is symbolic. Drinking a cup is symbolic of averting wrath. Jesus is talking about how he swallowed the wrath of God for us. Every ounce of the cup has been swallowed. Jesus didn't leave any drop left for any of us if we are in him to swallow. This is why we have an assurance of pardon every week after our confessional prayer to remind us that you don't have to swallow the wrath that Jesus swallowed it for you, right? To remind us that in Jesus, there is no condemnation uh, for those of us who have looked to him by faith. This is good news. We don't have to swallow the cup of wrath that Jesus condescended to came down to swallow it for us. Verse 26, Paul says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Paul says, look, when you guys gather together and you think about this selfless sacrifice that Jesus made, did you, don't you know you're proclaiming, you're preaching the gospel to one another? That word proclaim in the Greek is katangelo. It's different than the preaching I'm doing now. That's caruso. That's proclaiming the good news to build up the church. Katangelo has an evangelistic bent. It's telling someone news that they may not be aware of. Paul says, did you know when you gather together and you actually take the Lord's Supper, you're preaching. You're preaching, yes, to one another. But Paul knows, and we're going to see in just a few chapters, he knows there's going to be non-believers at the gathering. 
There, there, some in this room don't believe the good news of Jesus. And he knows that when we believers take the cup, right, and we take the bread and we take it in, we are preaching a sermon to non-believers. Did you know that? We preach through a sermon, but we also preach through the supper. We preach the good news of the gospel to, to non-believers. We're saying, look, any, anybody can get in on this. You don't have to be anybody special. You don't have to have a, a good life or, or a notorious record. Look at me. You can get in on this, right? By faith, this is a free gift. You know, we've heard before in our society the words of St. Francis of Assisi, which are terrible words that you can preach the gospel wherever you go when necessary, use words. He was saying, you don't have to tell anybody the good news of Jesus. You just have to show people the good news of Jesus. Well, that doesn't make any sense because the good news of Jesus is news. I doubt you've ever heard a newscaster give the news without speaking. It wouldn't make any sense, would it? There is one time and one time only when you can actually tell the gospel without words. It's the Lord's Supper. It's the only time. That's the only time. Not only are we preaching the cost of Christ together, Paul says you're preaching of the coming of Christ because Paul says you proclaim the Lord's death until he what? Comes. Paul clearly sees an anticip anticipatory uh, layer to the Lord's Supper. This is just temporary. This is just temporary. Do you know there will be a, a time when we eat a better Lord's Supper, when we eat the marriage supper of the Lamb, when Jesus descends, right, and we are raised in our physical glorified body free of sin, and we will sit around the table, not with just one another. Yes, we will, but we'll sit with the Apostle Paul. We'll sit with some of, uh, of the members of the church in Corinth. We'll sit with the people from every tribe, tongue, and nation feasting with Jesus. Paul knows that. That's what he's saying. This is just temporary. This is just temporary. Notice two times we see Jesus saying, do this in remembrance of me. Do this in remembrance of me. Now, why would Jesus say that? Well, Jesus knows humanity's propensity to forget. I'm a very forgetful person. Ask my wife. She can't send me to the store without a list. And I, I don't think I'm alone, man, right? Some of your wives are nudging you now. Whether it's three items or 23 items, if I don't have a list, I'm going to forget. Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. When you do it, and it should be done. Now we say we want to do it weekly so we don't forget. Some churches do it monthly or quarterly. That's fine. Do it often. Do it regularly. But when you do it, you don't forget. We don't forget. We take communion weekly to see with our eyes and remember with our hearts what Jesus has done so we don't forget. It is our list, so to speak, of the gospel that we don't forget the gospel because clearly forgetfulness leads to selfishness. More than likely, if you're battling with selfishness, if you're battling with disunity in the church, you have forgotten the gospel. You, you have failed to see the reality of Christ's love for you. you. You have failed to see his selfless sacrifice and the unity that he has purchased. Clearly, the Corinthians have. That's why Paul's reminding them of this. The third characteristic of the Lord's Supper is that it demands we examine our own self. It demands that we examine our own self. And then we need to ask the question, do we continually do this? Do we continually examine the content of our hearts? Paul says in verse 27 and 28, whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Underline unworthy manner. And then he says in verse 28, let a person examine himself then and so eat the bread and drink the cup. Notice here, Paul warns against the manner in which we are to eat the Lord's Supper. He doesn't warn against the people that eat the Lord's Supper. He doesn't say, if you're unworthy, you can't eat the Lord's Supper. Why? Because we're all unworthy. None of us are worthy to eat the Lord's Supper. Paul says, but there is a way in which you are to eat it. You're not to eat it in an unworthy manner. What might he mean? Well, contextually, he's talking about a manner that ignores sin against others in the body, a, a heart filled with arrogance and pride and selfishness and division, uh, divisiveness towards others while yet declaring that Jesus has saved them through taking the Lord's Supper. You see why Paul would say that, that doesn't make sense. That's incongruent and inconsistent. That, that's, that's hypocritical. How can you say that? How can you say that Jesus has, has saved you and brought you into a body yet you're living 
uh, inconsistently with that profession and divisiveness with the body. That's taking the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. But it would also be unworthy or an unworthy manner for someone to take the Lord's Supper, declare that Jesus has paid for all of their sins, including their lust, but yet Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, coddle your porn addiction, man. That would be an unworthy manner. It would be un, an un, unworthy manner to declare with the Lord's Supper that Jesus has saved you from your anger and your hostility and your bitterness, right? But live Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday with this constant bitterness and anger. It would be unworthy to say, yes, Jesus, yes, you freed me from covetousness, but yet Monday and Tuesday, your heart's continually jealous for the things that you don't have. That would be an unworthy manner, right? So, so I think Paul's saying, hey, look, when you take the Lord's Supper, you better carefully examine the sin that's there because Jesus didn't save you merely just to get you into heaven. He saved you to change you and make you a new creation in him. That doesn't mean we don't sin. That means we're aware of our sin and we can bring it to him. We can confess it. We can ask him to change us. We can repent of our sin. So Paul says, examine yourself. Examine. He says in verse 29, anyone who eats or drinks without discerning, without examining the body, I, I think he means the body of Christ. I think he means the church without discerning what your sin would do to the church, given the context, eats and drinks judgment on himself. He says, that's why many of you are weak and ill. Some have even died. That's fallen asleep, which is Paul's, Paul's verbiage for believers that have died. But if we're judged, if we judged ourselves truly, if we examined ourselves, we wouldn't be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we're disciplined. We're not condemned. That's what he says in verse 32. It is discipline. Notice what Paul is saying. He says, look, if you flippantly and selfishly approach the table while you're still sinning against the body, right? While you're uh, harboring bitterness towards a sister, while you're harboring resentment towards a brother, while you're uh, being selfish and then uh, disunified uh, towards the body, like this church is, you drink judgment on yourself. And he says, because of this, God's disciplined some of you. And here the discipline has manifested itself in sickness and even death. Now, don't let that scare you. We need to understand a few things about sickness and in death. That's all the result of sin, clearly. But sometimes in Scripture, it is the result of specific sin. Not always. Not all sickness and not all death is related to a specific sin. In John chapter 9, verse 2, if you'll put that slide on the screen, maybe you know the story of the man born blind. Jesus was with his, with his disciples, and they look at Jesus as they see the man born blind, and, and they ask him this question, Jesus, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Clearly, they saw a connection to sickness and sin. And if you know the story, Jesus says, no, 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 not this case. No, this one is for the glory of God, and Jesus heals the man. So not all sickness is the re uh, result of our personal sin. That's clear in Scripture. However, sometimes it is. Look at what the text says. Go read James chapter 5 and see. It's, James says some of you are sick and you're ill because there's unconfessed sin in your life. Paul clearly says it here. In that sickness, God is disciplining. No, he's not condemning his people because Jesus condemned, was condemned in their place. He's talking about believers who are walking in unrepentant sin while taking the Lord's Supper. He's saying this is why some of you are being disciplined by God, and that discipline is physical illness. And if you think to yourself, well, that's the God of the Old Testament. That couldn't be the God of the New Testament. Keep in mind the story of Acts 5, Ananias and Sapphira. You guys know that story? They sell a piece of land. They make a lot of money. They lie about their profit. They lay a portion of it at the apostles' feet and they're, they're struck dead. And the issue isn't just giving. The issue is greed, right? Why are they struck dead? All they had to do was be honest about how much they made. But they wanted to hoard some to their self and they're struck dead. That's in Acts. That's also in the New Testament. And, and God doesn't change, by the way, from the Old Testament to the New Testament. He never changes. He says that about himself. So I think we can apply this to our lives. Sometimes we are in sickness or in a difficult situation because of the sin we've brought on ourselves and the Lord disciplines us so that we would turn from that, right? And we repent and there is healing there. 
So maybe some of you in this room are enduring an illness that will not go away, but at the same time, you're harboring sin that you will not forsake. And week after week, you're coming to the Lord's table. The Lord and his grace is stopping you. And he wants you to see maybe there is a connection between that illness and your sin. Paul closes this out by saying, so then my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone's hungry, let them eat at home. So that when you come together, it's not for judgment about the other things. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you directions when I come. Paul says, when you come together, wait. That word is also share with one another. Paul has to say, look, when you come together, stop it with the selfishness. Stop acting like children, which I think is the main point here. The Lord's Supper should be an antidote against our selfishness. We go back to the question that this third section of this argument should bring to our minds. Am I examining continually the content of my heart? Paul says in verse 27, there's an unworthy manner by which you can approach the table. And he says, so examine yourself. You have an intentional opportunity this morning to do that before we take the Lord's Supper. And you need to remember the good news. The good news is this. As you take the supper, you drink the cup, right? You need to remember that's a sweet taste of grape juice, right? Some churches, it's wine. You know the cup that Jesus drank was the bitter cup of God's wrath for you? How could you continue to coddle sin when Jesus drank the bitter cup for you? You get to drink the sweet cup to remember that. You get to eat this bread, right? Which points us to the body of Jesus that was broken. It wasn't your body that was broken. It was Jesus' body that was broken if you're in him. You get to remember that Paul's not telling us that if we're unworthy, we can't come to the table. No, 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 no. None of us are worthy. We should have all been condemned, but Jesus was condemned in our stead. We should have all been laid in a tomb, but Jesus went to the tomb with our name in it. And we we should have all paid the price, but God sent his son to pay the price. And we know it was accepted because there's an empty tomb. We should remember that. There, there's None of us are worthy to take the meal, but there is a way that we can approach the table in an unworthy manner. And that's ignoring the sin that we've coddled all week. Let's not do that. If the band would come up. I hope you see the Lord's Supper as an antidote for selfishness. And at its core, all sin is selfish because all sin says, God, your way is not good enough. I'll have it my way. I'll lust because I don't think that in you is pleasure. I'll covet because I don't think you provide for my needs. Do you see how it's selfishness? So as we close, we have two C's. How do we approach the Lord's table in a worthy manner? Well, we confess our sins and we come to Jesus. Two C's. Two C's. It it means we're going to acknowledge we're not worthy to take the supper. We have sin in our life and we want to throw them on Jesus because as Tyler reminded us, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. So there's sins that you brought in here. You know them. Confess them to Jesus. And maybe there's sins that you didn't know about. The Lord is exposed. Maybe there's sins that you need to run through those three questions again. And I would say this is an appropriate exercise every Sunday before the Lord's Supper. So if you took notes, keep these notes in a good location. And every time you take the Lord's Supper, just ask yourself these three questions. Am I living in unity with the body? Have I forgotten Christ's death? And do I continually examine my heart? That will reveal the sin that's in you. So we're going to take just a moment and we're going to confess the sin that's in us Before the Lord, I'm going to lead. I'll lead us in a prayer of confession, another prayer of confession, and then we're going to come to the table. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you with intentional time to confess our sins. We acknowledge that we have lived selfishly. I've I've lived selfishly. I confess my sin of pride and self-righteousness. I confess my sin of longing for approval. I confess those to you. And your people confess their sins to you, knowing that you're faithful and merciful and that Jesus has covered our sins. And we repent. We ask you don't leave us in our sin. You free us from it. In Jesus' name, would you stand?